It wasn't until July of 2017, I just turned 11, and I said, you know, if the adults are going to do something, I'm going to have to step up and do something. Uh, so I decided to phone the Truth Gazette in an effort to fight the fake news media. Brylan Hollyhan wrote that op-ed, and he joins me now. Brylan, thanks for getting up with us this morning. You know, you Here with me now to bring some levity to this otherwise frustrating time is Brylan Hollyhan. He's a teenager from the Truth Gazette, and he's gotten some pretty big names. One of those upstanding young men and women who are taking matters into their own hands in the media world 15-year-old Brylan Hollyhan. Brylan Hollyhan is the co-chair of the RNC's inaugural Youth probably, Advisory Council. Brylan, that is probably the nicest introduction I ever got. I've got to tell you, I'm impressed. I Myself. wish that other reporters around the country were as smart and talented <laughs> and knowledgeable at, about the issues as you are. Oh, thank you for having me, Brylan, and thanks for your almost five-year incredible success with the Truth Gazette. Good for you. How bad the country is. So I think the American mm -hmm. people have realized that when they elected a clown to office, this is the circus that was to follow. To wake up, yeah. we have to start involving my generation and focusing on winning over the youth vote if we want a shot at winning in 2024. Hello, America. I'm Brylan Hollyhan, 17-year-old conservative commentator and host of the Brylan Hollyhan Show. Today we're here on the campus of Auburn University with a guy that I've gotten to know. Uh, you might you know, recognize his face. He's been on this show before several years ago, but since we've got a lot to catch up on. So joining me now is none other than former HUD secretary under the President Trump's administration, 2026, 2016 presidential candidate, and world-renowned neurosurgeon, Dr. Ben Carson. Dr. Carson, thank you for coming back. We're honored to have you. Good to be with you again. You've grown a few inches. <laughs> just a few. <laughs> just a few. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You know, the last time we spoke, uh, you know, I sat down and interviewed you in your office just a few days before the end of President Trump's administration. Now, three years later, the country is almost unrecognizable, the one we lived in back during that interview. What do you think when you look out at the America that we live in today? Well, I think we're going to need a lot of young people like yourself who are courageous and understand what an incredible gift to the world this country is. And uh, sometimes it has to be pretty dark before people can see the light. <laughs> I think we've gotten there. Yeah, I think we have. I think we have. I think you're right. Uh, as I just mentioned, you ran for president back in 2016. Let's say tomorrow that you became president of the United States. What would be the first thing you would do when taking office to set our country back on track as a leader of the free world? I would remind the people that our founding document, the Declaration of Independence, tells us that our rights come from God and not from government, and that we need to be a people-centric nation, not a government-centric nation. We need a lot more of that back up in Washington. <laughs> we miss you out there desperately. Uh, you know, two days ago, we had elections across the country. One specific election in Ohio offered a constitutional amendment to codify abortion rights in their state constitution. That effort passed unanimously. The right to murder an innocent baby is now protected under their state constitution. Roe v. Wade was overturned last summer thanks to the administration that you served in, but now we're seeing states like Ohio continuing to support this atrocity. What should we in the pro-life movement be doing nationally to protect the unborn? Well, it's very important that we understand that the solution is going to be through convincing people, not coercing people. Yes. <laughs> and uh, we have to adjust uh, our speech accordingly. Of course, we don't want any lives to be lost, but we need to understand that it's a progression. And, uh, you know, Roe v. Wade, that's one step in the right direction. Uh, Fifteen weeks would be another step in the right direction. Six weeks would be another step in the right direction. We just keep moving forward and helping people to understand the value of life. And I think a lot of the young people are seeing this because they've grown up in an era where we can actually see what is in that Absolutely. So it's much more difficult to say it's a meaningless bunch of cells when you can see it. Yes, no, you're completely right. I think our, you know, in conversations on college campuses that I travel to, we're seeing that with our generation. They're, they're waking up a little bit, which is so so great, awesome to see. We hope that my generation will be the generation that you know, bans abortion once and for all. Well, I, I, I hope in the future people will look back at this time and say, wow. The barbarians, but they actually finally figured it out. Yes, yes, and hopefully, hopefully we can have that happen pretty soon. 
Oh, you know, if Donald Trump was reelected to the White House next November, say he calls you that next morning, he asks you to come back and serve in his cabinet, would you say yes? Well, let me put it this way. I will always do what the Lord wants me to do. But I very much enjoy my time in the private sector. Yeah, no. <laughs> would, would you be interested in a, in a HUD you know, secretary position again, or are you looking at something else? I am looking to save our country. And I would probably leave that that. <laughs> <laughs> well, we would love to see you back up there, for sure. You're missed, you're missed dearly. Uh, you know, I don't think it's a secret that the former president won't be tapping Mike Pence, someone that uh, we both know pretty pretty well, uh, you know, to serve as his vice president again. What advice would you have for whoever he selects to be his next running mate? Uh, or is there a specific person you have in mind that he should pick? Well, I think it, it needs to be uh, someone who can uh, sort of balance off a little bit the hyperactivity that we sometimes see. Sure. Yeah. And, uh, you know, his policies are wonderful policies, and they stood us in very good stead around the world. Um, the rhetoric sometimes uh, was kind of productive. And as a result, you have a bunch of people who love his policies, but are so turned off by the rhetoric that, that they don't act in a rational way. Sure. Because what would be more rational to, to vote for somebody who maybe irritates you with their words, but has wonderful policies that makes you like better? Or somebody who has a smooth tongue, silver tongue, and just creates all kinds of habit. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, no, I completely agree. Yeah, oh, you know, tonight in your speech, you're going to be talking about an executive branch for America program that you just recently launched to help get conservative college students involved in today's political world. Would you like to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, well, you know, when people go to Washington, either newly elected officials or staffers, it generally takes them at least a year just to get acclimated to what's going on. There's, there's so many complicated relationships. And uh, the Executive Branch for America is to give them that knowledge before they get there so they can hit the ground running. Because uh, in many cases, you only have a couple of years. And if you waste one of them just trying to figure out what's going on, you're not going to get a lot done. <laughs> so I don't think the uh, the Obama administration gave you a how-to sheet when you came in office, did they? Didn't uh, they gave you a sheet of rules and regulations <laughs> to keep you from being oh, successful. Yeah. Oh, that's a lot of red tape. Then. Yeah, that's, I could never, could never do that. That's too much to deal with. Uh, closing out here today, tonight you will be addressing a packed room of students, about 1,200 on campus here at Auburn University. A lot of people in the room tonight, like myself, will be first time voters next November. Uh, you know, what message will we be giving to our generation tonight? I would help people to understand that everybody has a sphere of influence. So don't feel that you're helpless and that you're uh, of no value. Uh, you can affect a lot of people. And the other message is that we, the American people, are not each other's enemies. And don't allow yourself to be manipulated into thinking that we are enemies, because that's how they destroy our nation. Yes, absolutely. That's powerful. And we're really looking forward to hearing it. Dr. Carson, thank you so much for taking the time. I know you're very busy. We appreciate you doing this. It's a pleasure. I'll probably see you again when you're a correspondent in college. <laughs> yes, sir. Well, I'll take up a few years for another a third interview. Uh, for more interviews of the Brown Holly Handshake, go to thebrownhollyhandshow.com or look us up on your favorite podcasting platform. Obviously, you can follow myself, Brown Holly Hand, on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok. Dr. Carson is on all of them as well, so make sure to check him out because he's got great content. So, again, Dr. Carson, thank you so much. I appreciate, appreciate you doing this. Yes, sir.